Hello everyone. Let's analyze. So today we're going to talk about the continuity of composite functions and also uniform continuity. So let's get right into it. Before we get into whether functions of functions are continuous, uh, let's talk about what the image of a function is. It's essentially every outcome of the function when applied to every element of the domain. In other words, it's the set of every number f of x for every x in the domain. And we typically express it as f of d because we're applying f to every element of d. And the set of outcomes is exactly what the image is. Now notice this set to the right of the arrow, right, f maps d to r, this is what's called a codomain. So the image is necessarily a subset of the codomain. So now we get into whether a composite function is continuous. So let's let f map d to r, and let's let g map d prime to r. And let's assume that the image of f is a subset of d prime, which is the domain of g. And let's assume that f is continuous at x naught, and g is continuous at f of x naught. Then g composed with f, in other words, g of f of x naught is continuous at x naught. Well, let's prove it. <clears throat> Suppose f maps d to r and g maps d prime to r and the image of f is a subset of the domain of g. In other words, let's assume that the hypothesis of our theorem is true because of course that's well, the world we live in when we're proven a theorem. f is continuous at x naught, g is continuous at f of x naught. Well given an arbitrary epsilon greater than zero we need to show that there exists a delta for which the following is true. If x minus x naught is less than delta then g of f of x which is g composed with f evaluated at x minus g of f of x naught is less than epsilon. Okay, if this is true, then this is true. Okay, so what do we know? Well, we know g is continuous at f of x naught, meaning there exists a delta 1 and if y minus f of x naught is less than delta 1, by the way, what is y and f of x naught? Well, y and f of x naught are both elements of the domain of g. Right? We know that there exists a delta 1, so that if this is true, then this is true. g of y minus g of f of x naught. That's just the definition of continuity apply to g at the point f of x naught. Now we also know that f is continuous at x naught. So we know that we can make f at f of x as close to f of x naught as we like. Well, how close do we want to make it? Well, we want to make it delta 1 close. In other words, we want to use delta 1 in place of epsilon. The same delta 1 as here. So there exists another delta, delta 2. And if x is an element of the domain, and x minus x naught is less than delta 2, then f of x minus f of x naught is less than delta 1. Now, by the way, f of x is in the image of f. And the image of f is a subset of the domain of g. Therefore, f of x is in the domain of g. In other words, g of f of x is a well-defined number. We can come call that number y. 
In other words, we have two elements of the domain of G less than delta 1. That is, this condition is satisfied. And if this condition is satisfied, then, then, this condition is satisfied. So g of y, that is g of f of x, minus g of f of x naught, is less than epsilon. And we've shown our result. In other words, so long as x minus x naught is less than delta, g of f of x minus g of f of x naught, and the absolute value is less than epsilon. QED, says I. Okay. Now we're going to get to the idea of uniform continuity. First, let me give the definition, and then let me talk about what is the idea. So a function mapping D to R is uniformly continuous on a subset E of the domain D if and only if for epsilon greater than 0 and for any epsilon greater than 0, there exists a positive delta such that if x and y are is in this subset of uniform continuity and their absolute difference is less than delta then f of x minus f of y in absolute value is less than epsilon now upon first glance you might say well what's the difference between uniform continuity and regular continuity well, it's really a matter of order. In regular continuity, we talk about the function being continuous at a particular point, x0. And x0 is named before we say that there exists a delta, because the delta depends on x0. But here, the delta doesn't depend on x0. It just says, for epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta, right? And the value x or y hasn't even been mentioned yet. For epsilon, there's a delta. Delta cares deeply about epsilon, but delta could care less about x and y. Right? Delta's got nothing to do with x and y. Delta depends only on epsilon. So that's the key concept. The key concept of uniform continuity is that the choice of delta depends only on epsilon and not on the function argument x or y. In other words, for every epsilon greater than zero, the same choice of delta guarantees that for every xy pair within delta of each other in the region of uniform continuity, then the absolute difference of f of x and f of y is less than epsilon. Well, let's take a look at an example. Let's consider the function f defined by 3 divided by x minus 2 and defined on the domain 2.5 to 3. So we have a domain of length 0.5. We need to show that f is uniformly continuous on this domain. We need to find a delta greater than 0 such that for every xy in the interval 2.5 to 3, so long as the absolute value of x minus y is less than delta, then f of x minus f of y is less than epsilon. And of course, delta depends only on epsilon. Okay, so let's dive right in to our goal. Let's dive right in to this and figure out if we can see what delta has to be, right? Let's just kind of take f of x minus f of y and just break it down. So f of x minus f of y is, well, f of x is 3 divided by x minus 2, and f of y is 3 divided by y minus 2. We can put our two fractions over a common denominator, x minus 2 times y minus 2. That'll give us a numerator, 3y minus 2 minus 3x minus 2. Once I cancel things up and 
get rid of the debris, I get 3 times y minus x divided by x minus 2 times y minus 2. Okay, now when is the denominator smallest? Because when the denominator is smallest, the fraction is biggest. Well, remember that the domain, that is the values that x and y are allowed to be in, is the interval 2.5 to 3. Well, the closer to 2 x is, the smaller this number is. So the numerator is smallest when x is 2.5. Same thing for y. That makes the denominator smallest possible, which makes the fraction as big as possible. So then this is less than or equal to, right? If I replace x in the denominator with 2.5 and y also with 2.5 in the denominator. Well, 2.5 minus 2, that's 0.5 uh, times 0.5, that's 0.25. And the 3 and the 0.25 can be factored out, and I just get y minus x. Now, 3 divided by a quarter, that's 12. Now, if y minus x is less than delta, then 12 times the absolute value of y minus x is 12 delta. Well, remember, we want this term to be less than epsilon. And it's less than 12 delta, where delta is the upper bound on the difference of y and x. Well then, let's just use delta to be epsilon over 12. Then if x minus y is less than epsilon over 12, f of x minus f of y is less than 12 times x minus y. We just show that above here. x minus y is less than epsilon over 12. The 12s cancel and I get epsilon. And notice that delta depended only on epsilon, not on the choice of x or y. Now let's consider a function that is not uniformly continuous. In other words, if I choose an epsilon, there's no delta I can choose. None, not a single delta I can choose that would guarantee that every single x and y within this delta guarantees f of x minus f of y uh, is less than epsilon. The formal way to say that is a function f is not uniformly continuous on some subset E if there exists an epsilon greater than zero such that for any positive delta, then there exists a x and y pair whose difference is bounded by delta, but f of x minus f of y is not less than epsilon. In other words, it's greater than or equal to it. So that's what we gotta show to show that f of x is not uniformly continuous on the set zero to one. Right. Since it's not uniformly continuous, um, it has to not satisfy the condition for some epsilon. Well, okay, let's pick epsilon equals to 1. Now, we have to suppose that delta is positive, but arbitrary. Right? Arbitrary. There's no delta in the world that would satisfy the condition for epsilon equals 1 of uniform continuity. In other words, I got to show that there exists a pair x and y satisfying that x and y are within delta of each other, but f of x minus f of y is greater than 1, right? Because we chose epsilon to be 1. So let's build our pair. Well, First, let's set alpha to be either 2 or delta, whichever is smaller. Remember, delta is arbitrary. So it's an arbitrary positive number. So alpha is, an, is a positive number. Let's let x be alpha divided by 3. Remember, that's either 2 over 3 or delta over 3, whichever is smaller. 
and let y be alpha over 6, meaning y is either a third or delta over 6, which again, whichever is smaller. Right, but x and y are, well, particular numbers. They depend on delta, though. Now, notice that whatever alpha is, x and y are between 0 and 1. So, x minus y in absolute value is alpha over 3 minus alpha over 6, which is a sixth of alpha, which is necessarily less than delta. All right, because alpha is less than or equal to del delta, and if we divide a positive number by 6, well, we get something smaller. In fact, we get a sixth of it. Now let's consider the absolute value of f of x and f of y. That's equal to 3 over alpha minus 6 over alpha. Because, well, remember that f of x is just the reciprocal. So I get 3 minus 6 over alpha, which is 3 over alpha, which is greater than or equal to 1. Why? Because remember, alpha is either 2 or smaller. If it's 2, I get 3 halves, and if it's smaller, I get something bigger than 3 halves. Either way, it's bigger than 1, which is epsilon. Which means we've proved the negation of the definition of uniform continuity. So, 1 over x is not uniformly continuous on the interval 0 to 1. Now, is it continuous on the interval 0 to 1? Of course it is. Could you prove it? Of course you can. How do I know? Well, it's in your homework. You'll have to. What? A hint, you say? Well, in fact, I would venture to say it's fairly straightforward given what we've done. 1 is continuous. x is continuous. The quotient of continuous functions are continuous so long as the denominator is never zero. I think you can take it from there. That's it for today.